Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to do a webinar tonight on uh, European Union and European Commission gender policies. And this is a webinar uh, we are doing in the scope of project that is organized by Green European Foundation uh, with the support of Cooperation and Development Network and uh, uh, with the financial support of European Parliament to the Green European Foundation and supported by European Youth Foundation of Council of Europe. And tonight we have a guest with us, Vesna. Thank you, Vesna, for joining us. And Vesna is a long-term green activist that uh, started her journey with Serbian Green Youth and um, he was involved with CDN for almost a decade as a volunteer, executive committee member and network coordinator eventually. Uh, at the moment, Vesna is working uh, in the European Green Party as head of the Policy Strategy and Capacity Development Unit. Uh, she graduated in art history, but she's devoting most of her time and attention to the climate change and gender equality topics. Uh, Vesna, I will give you the floor. Now we can start with presentation and uh, as for participants and everyone that is following us on Facebook, there will be space later on for questions. Thanks a lot, Elena. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think this is a rather important topic to, to know, although um, it's a bit complicated. So um, basically the most of this session we will devote to a map of um, different actors, different stakeholders, and try to understand a bit uh, who has which competencies. Um, because when it comes to the gender topic and gender policy, um, it's not that easy to, to separate it because it's not an area where you can kind of bring one um, legislation and then it's all solved because um, if we want to work on gender, um, then we also have to work on uh, education, on labor policies, um, economic policies, taxation, um, transport, mobility, and so on and so on. So um, yeah, in that sense, um, it's good to know and understand where in the European Union um, we have um, stakeholders which are relevant for this. And then I was specifically asked by CDN to um, target or to um, enlighten um, the topics where, where we can see um, the relevance for the Eastern European countries that are not part of the European Union. So where can we actually interact uh, with the EU uh, as such? Um, so I will um, show you a couple of slides with a lot of text, but feel free to ignore the text because uh, it's just to illustrate certain things. Um, and uh, I will leave the presentation there. Um, however, yeah, let, let's just focus on, on keywords so don't get scared by it. So first and foremost, um, the yeah the, the short map of European Union that still includes UK here. So um, yeah, let's see how that ends up, but that's for another webinar maybe. Um, so I just wanted quickly to um, to kind of um, make clear uh, when we say EU, what does that actually mean? Because um, also um, coming from Serbia myself and working in CDN for a very long time, we are used to speak about European Union as a unified body, as if there would be um, one person, one body, um, one group um, that um, decides everything and it represents only one entity, um, which is absolutely not true. Um, so um, to start with, um, there are four different bodies um, in the European Union that have uh, certain uh, competencies and that are um, responsible for different parts of functioning um, when it comes to the EU um, policy making as such. So um, what we usually um, mean when we say European Union, um, especially outside of the EU, is the work of the European Commission, um, which is maybe the most visible um, in, in media to us and maybe the most kind of relevant um, on a daily basis of, um, um, of the communications they do towards us. Um, commission represents sort of, but I mean, again, this is now just really plastically explained. Um, commission represents sorts of ministries. 
So let's say that European Union represents one political entity um, and then commission would be sort of ministries. So you have a commission for um, environment, you have a commission for uh, trade, you have a commissioner um, for um, mobility, um, literally what, what would be on a national level, the work on ministries. Um, they also have the right to propose legislation. Um, and then that goes to two other bodies. One is European Parliament. Um, this is the parliament where um, we have um, now, I think 700 um, plus um, members um, of parliament, um, which are as any parliament um, functions in the, you know, on the national level, um, having different debates on the legislations and eventually adopt them. Um, European Parliament consists of parliamentarians that are coming from all European countries and they are elected at the European elections. However, these elections, um, they are European in a sense that uh, people elected do go to uh, European Parliament. However, they still correspond very much to national agenda in a sense that um, European elections um, are happening in every country under the national legislation um, and with the national regulations. Um, and then the third body um, in this um, so-called trilogue is the Council of European Union. And this is something that um, matters a lot in a sense that um, this is exactly the place where this concept of unified Europe um, trembles the most because Council of European Union represents a body where ministries from all countries come together. So, um, for example, if you have a Council of um, European Union, that means that all heads of states uh, will come together and there they will also um, have a debate and participate in um, adoption of, of the legislation. Um, or all ministries of environment will come together or all ministries of foreign affairs and so on and so on. Um, this is very important to, to understand uh, how this body functions because um, also when you say, oh, EU can do this or EU can do that, um, it doesn't mean that people sitting in Brussels, um, as usually explained, uh, have the full power to bring decisions because also the ministries from the national level um, have to participate in this um, Council of European Union and then uh, also adaptation of legislation. I know it sounds a bit uh, complicated and uh, um, I would just, I mean, it, it takes um, time to digest it, but my main point here would be to just understand that when we say European Union, this is um, at least um, three institutions that are participating in this uh, policy making, um, out of which uh, one has a only proposal, um, um, level of ignorance is uh, the ministries, so-called, or the commission, um, what we see and what we usually hear in, uh, in non-European countries. Then you have a European parliament um, that has very open debates um, and adopts the legislation. And then very important body, which we rarely hear about um, if you are not part of the European Union, um, which is Council of European Union, where um, basically the ministries from national level have um, declarative say. Um, I would also like to mention here European Court of Justice because it is um, a very important uh, body in the European Union and I will um, give later a bit of um, uh, one example for um, where we can see what role it can play in the, uh, in the gender policies. So um, a lot of text which you can completely ignore uh, in a way, I'm just repeating myself that European Parliament is basically um, elected by the EU voters, um, the Court of Justice, yeah, the Council of European Union um, is the voice of the government. This is what I was saying. Um, and uh, I think on the gender level this plays or, or on the gender topic this plays a really big role um, because as such um, gender um, equality, it is um, not a competence. So you cannot really legislate um, so, so directly as much as it's more kind of a value or a goal implemented in other um, legislation as well. Um, yeah, so where um, does the gender equality comes on this map? Um, so there is a new commission, so European Commission work program um, for 2021. And gender equality is mentioned there um, only in the point 39, um, basically focusing on gender-based violence uh, and um, kind of promising um, an action um, to um, prevent and combat specific forms of gender-based violence with the legislative file. Um, what this tells you is that um, 
for sure gender-based violence is as a priority as a topic. It also tells you that all other aspects of gender equality are not priority um, and the topic for 2021, um, which is fine because we also have just as much resources to deal um, with a certain topic. Um, and then, um, yeah, th this is going to come there, um, which basically means that next year we should expect more debate. Um, we should expect more research. We should expect more um, political action. And eventually we should expect the legislation uh, on gender-based violence uh, on the level of the EU. Um, so a bit bigger picture uh, when it comes to European Commission, um, what you can find there uh, is annual report on equality between men and women, um, which is very um, deep research um, on every country. Uh, and it provides a good, um, good base. It provides a good uh, place where you can go um, and um, yeah, get basic um, understanding of where does certain country qualifies when it comes to equality between men and women in um, European Union. So uh, it's done annually. Um, and uh, um, it also shows you like which categories are prioritized or it shows you like which aspects of gender equality we are looking at. Um, commission also has gender equality strategy. Um, it's um, th this commission, which um, has started its mandate last year, um, is also um, having a big um, discussion on gender equality strategy because it was kind of promised that this will be the most gender equal commission we will we had so far, um, which is not hard um, to achieve. Um, also, this is the first time that we have a woman as a president uh, of. Uh, uh, commission and there was a, a big promise, a big pledge that this commission took to um, not only bring gender equality um, on a topic of legislation, not only to bring gender equality um, as a as a value in uh, in the work with the member states uh, and on the EU level, but also to to use um, and to implement gender equality in its own structures. And um, it is true that this is the most um, gender equal commission we ever had. It's still not gender equal, um, but uh, then the question is, of course, um, wh 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 how much um, are we satisfied? Huh? Like, how big uh, changes do we expect to happen from one minute to another? Um, what can EU Commission do? Uh, as said, they, they can participate in EU uh, legislative work. Uh, they can uh, work on uh, institutional uh, structures uh, because representation matters, as we know and they have the external action prerogative. So influence on relations with the non-EU countries, which is um, something that um, might be interesting for you, which um, can um, um, focus on two different um, areas, maybe uh, to call them. Um, one is uh, on a direct um, external action. So all negotiations and all EU accession processes that are done at the moment with the um, uh, with the countries outside of the EU uh, that are um, aspiring to become members. Um, gender equality is represented there as one of the main values, which means that it has to be embedded in um, all the work that uh, countries like Serbia or um, Ukraine are doing on accession. Um, how strict they are, I would say, yeah, it, it's not that bad, but of course, um, there's always a question of um, how much you can, you should sanction uh, not fulfilling this um, gender equality um, prerogatives. Um, and then also another important topic is that when it comes to pre-accession projects, uh, gender equality is uh, also very much mentioned as one of the criterias. What is very important is that it's part of the administration. Um, which means that, for example, all the NGOs and uh, local authorities, when they are working with EU projects, they always have to answer the question on how does this project support gender equality or what is the gender equality aspect of your project and so on and so on, um, which I'm sure is driving them nuts. And um, um, I'm sure that in many cases, there's just not understanding on why do I need to answer this question? Um, and you know, why does the EU want to know how my bridge or um, the, the water system renovation will contribute to the gender perspective? Um, but just by the pure fact that it's there, 
it at least starts a debate. It at least requires um, locals to, to think about it. And then very often uh, it simply opens a space which needs to be filled with experts, with uh, representation, with um, theory. Um, and in that sense, it's very helpful, um, I would say, um, just simply by demand and supply um, logic. Um, so gender equality strategy um, of the European uh, Commission is uh, dated to 2020 uh, and 2025. Um, it's for their next mandate. As you can see, it has um, a lot of different um, objectives, um, ending gender-based violence, um, challenging gender stereotypes, and so on and so on. Um, but I marked um, in yellow um, the, the part that, again, um, confirms what I was saying, that uh, it has to be coherent with EU external policy, um, which means that uh, the external action uh, requires that uh, gender equality is part of the work. Uh, and then uh, there is uh, also um, a kind of a pledge uh, that uh, one of the first um, legislations uh, and the first deliverables that commission will do will be binding pay and transparency, which is a step forward um, equal pay uh, legislation, meaning that um, equal pay for equal work uh, directive should be uh, implemented. Um, I think it was 4th of November uh, recently, um, the day when kind of women technically start working for free, uh, meaning that um, um, the difference in pay that uh, women, uh, the, the lower amount of pay that women get for the same work uh, compared to men, uh, eats in a way um, almost two months uh, of our work, um, uh, work days uh, in a year. Um, and you can see that uh, on EU, um, um, EU level, uh, there are uh, different countries um, rate differently, but then EU average um, is also um, yeah, not that great. So in that sense, the, the equal pay and binding pay and transparency were taken as one of the uh, one of the priorities for this uh, commission. Um, it was imagined that this will happen in 2020, but then of course Corona happened and then the whole strategy had to be reshuffled. So um, hopefully it will be just uh, a bit postponed and not uh, completely um, reshuffled. But let's see. Uh, anyway, yeah, just um, as an information, this comes as a big topic. Um, so sort of uh, economic rights and labor rights um, priority. Um, then, of course, we have a equality commissioner. So as you remember, uh, commissioners are sort of ministries uh, of the European Union, um, and there is equality commissioner, um, which in its portfolio has a lot of um, yeah, different uh, uh, domains. Um, they all sound very um, important. Um, they are all offering a lot of um, a lot of uh, opportunities to work on the issue. Um, however, I, I would dare to say that. Um, among commissioners, there's a um, there's a prioritization and hierarchy, and equality commissioner is not one of the let's say top uh, commissions um, that um, EU is uh, implementing in its work. Um, which doesn't mean that um, the topic itself is not important, um, but it means that um, for sure the, the the space in the political action that um, is offered um, is not going to be one of the leading actions that commission is going to take. Uh, I would uh, also like to, uh, for example, here, uh, draw your attention to uh, work-life balance directive, which is something that came from the mandate of the last uh, commission, which is one of these big legislation files that was supposed to um, work on, um, um, on gender equality and especially women's rights um, that was um, then um, embedded in the, in the legislations. And this is something that um, is very interesting also for non-EU countries because um, I, I, for what I know, we have very, very little um, work-life balance directives or um, legislations in this area. Um, so um, this can be also an inspiration but it can also serve as a direct um, source of mandate to work um, on this uh, topic because it exists um, in the European legislation and um, it has a certain um, way of uh, practicing and enforcement um, where we can um, also demand this to be included um, in the countries that are in negotiation process with the EU. Um, yeah, and then uh, also worth mentioning Istanbul Convention. Um, Istanbul Convention is a bit wider uh, than the European Union. Um, 
and uh, there is uh, on European Union level, you have two uh, levels where we want every single member state to ratify and implement uh, Istanbul Convention, but then we also want EU as political entity to ratify and implement Istanbul Convention. Um, and then, of course, um, it would be nice if also all the countries outside of the EU would you know, ratify and implement Istanbul Convention. And since this is the element that connects us all, this is also a topic or area under which we can have a lot of uh, common projects and uh, we can have a lot of uh, common political actions. Um, now, going to the European Parliament, um, so we, we dealt with the commission a bit. In the commission, we have, uh, as I said, the, the, the gender strategy, uh, gender equality strategy, which also promised to focus on equal pay um, directive for start, um, that has a equality commissioner, and then it has also different uh, mandates within the, the previous work done that to reinforce them and to ensure the implementation and um, enforce them in different areas. Now, going to the European Parliament, um, European Parliament has um, a so-called FEM committee, uh, which is Committee for Women, Rights and uh, Gender Equality. Um, this committee has, um, like all the, all the committees within the European Parliament have also consultative role and they are the bodies in which the main kind of topical debate also happens. Um, and they, um, they also serve as sort of a working groups. Um, I'm just really simplifying this, but just to understand how committees work within the European Parliament. Um, what is important to understand is that um, these committees are uh, made out of parliamentarians from every um, parliamentarian group, which means that in FEM committee, you, you do have um, representatives of um, Greens, Liberals, Social Democrats, Left, um, Conservatives, uh, different type of Conservatives, um, Christian Democrats, and so on and so on. Um, so it's it's a place where um, parliamentarians with different political orientation would discuss um, topical uh, work, um, which in women rights um, also um, makes a bit of a of a, of a difference. Um, I just copied some of the agenda points for the FEM, um, just for you to understand. Um, what sort of work they do. Um, so they would, for example, give a lot of amendments to the documentation, to the reports, to the legislative um, documents, to the resolutions, um, in order to make them uh, more closer to the um, values and agenda of, uh, of the FEM committee. So you can see different amendments, for example. Um, they also give an opinion. Um, which is um, kind of um, a committee, a working group opinion on the general work uh, on certain topic of the European Parliament. Um, and through this FEM committee, um, Parliament and different groups are managing to um, to boost the work of the on the gender issues and gender policies. So, if you want to, um, I mean, how how to work with this? I would say that if you want to work. European Parliament on gender issues, uh, parliamentarians which are in the FEM committee are for sure your best shot. So um, uh, on the website of the parliament, you can um, always search the committees themselves. You can see which members of the parliament are inside of this committee, um, on which topics they are focusing, um, what is the priorities of the FEM committee itself, and then um, yeah, see how to interact uh, with this group. Um, I, I uh, linked here also the report on gender equality in EU foreign and security politics because this is something that uh, Greens are also focusing on as one of their priorities for the next mandate. Um, so um, yeah, I, mean, I, I would assume that uh, for a lot of um, audience here uh, coming from the from the green side of uh, civil society and political parties and youth wings, um, this is an um, interesting topic that you will have direct allies and uh, potentially the campaign um, to connect with. Um, also, uh, I, I would like to uh, say a few words on uh, LGBT topic and LGBT inequality. Um, there are uh, certain um, things that Commission is doing, uh, which is very useful, um, and that being reports, um, where a lot of information um, are digested, and then there's also kind of um, opinion pieces um, by the Commission. So, for example, um, legal re gender recognition in the EU is at the moment uh, in debate, and um, there's um, 
and discussion on the rights of the trans people towards for equality. Um, this is one of the reports that you can find now in the on the website of the Commission. Um, and uh, it's very useful when you work with this because this sort of information to gather them on the level of the whole Europe, um, it's a lot of work. Um, and then um, the Commission and other EU bodies are already doing this um, for us. So um, I, I think this is maybe Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're already all doing this, but um, at least for me, when when I was uh, working in uh, in NGOs, um, it was very um, enlightening to understand that EU institutions are not only institutions in a sense of policy making, but that. Um, also a lot of research on which they're basing their policy work is available um, to us as activists and that also helps us is now in our work a lot. So um, don't hesitate to check their websites for this kind of um, information because um, they are also very useful. Um, and then I would also like to mention that um, in the European Parliament next to and next to the FEM committee that works uh, with gender equality and women's rights, there is also an LGBT intergroup. Um, intergroups um, are sort of, um, let's say semi-official, I mean, they're official because they're part of the parliament, uh, but then they don't have a kind of a direct mandate in the legislation process itself. Um, so these are the groups um, that are also gathering um, members of parliament from all different um, groups on a voluntary basis. Um, so all the members of parliament who are um, invested and want to support the work um, on LGBT rights are joining this group. And uh, they have five priorities. One is uh, to work on freedom of movement for LGBT people, which is um, uh, also something within the mandate of the European Union and the Schengen Agreement um, to monitor the work of European Commission because for a moment um, com and in previous mandate Commission does not really have a specific um, focus on LGBT policies, um, at least not in a, in a way that it would have a separate institution for that or separate kind of pocket uh, where this um, topic will be discussed. Um, to combat discrimination, of course, uh, securing trust, gender and intersex rights, which is something that we don't necessarily um, talk enough about, or at least not that specifically, and then monitor human rights in the work of the um, European Union, because as I said before, um, when it comes to the EU, it's not only about the policy making, it's really about um, having a personal example or showing um, a personal example in the institutional and structural work um, on the level of EU institutions. Quickly jumping to European Court of Justice. Um, European Court of Justice um, had um, uh, different um, cases that are based on uh, gender equality. I just wanted to illustrate one, um, for example, where um, Court of Justice um, kind of brought um, um, decision or it was uh, it was ruling against the insurance companies uh, because insurance companies were um, charging lower car insurance premiums to women um, than to men because um, yeah for different reasons um, but um, Anyway, um, the case was taken to the court and the insurance company lost, uh, where the European Court of Justice clearly said that insurance companies are not allowed to treat men and women differently when it comes to the insurance premiums. So um, this is sort of a case that, um, um, yeah, takes together uh, institution um, and uh, a private sector as well, uh, where it kind of clearly has a mandate to ensure that treatment of men and women um, remains equal. Um, you can also um, go on European Court of Justice and see which sort of cases um, are there. But um, just to be clear um, that European Court of Justice is not um, what we are used to work with in the non-EU countries as a um, uh, European Court of Human Rights. Um, so in a sense, this is not the place where um, we can you know, sue our governments for constantly ignoring gender equality or for very specific cases of breach of gender equality. This is um, something else. Um, but still, um, you can also find an interesting examples on how far um, the gender inequality can go and on, you know, like in, in, in which areas um, we still have work to do. Uh, sorry. Okay, um, let me just see if the video will be working. But okay, um, so now I want to um, 
wrap up um, the institutional part. Um, as you can see, there, there's a legislation that we can do um, with a priority of equal pay directive for this year. Um, there is a lot of um, consultative work that EU institutions are doing, a lot of reports, uh, a lot of research that EU institutions are working doing on um, gender equality. Um, and then there is a, a lot of monitoring uh, and a lot of auditing, like gender auditing from institutions themselves um, to ensure that gender equality is not only um, a policy topic, but also a practical policy uh, within the institutions. Um, but then there's another side of the coin as well. Uh, and I'm sure that um, in last years you have all heard um, about Me Too movement, um, which also had its own repercussion uh, in the EU. Um, and uh, this is uh, just to, to start with the negative, but then uh, I would also like to give a, um, a short um, positive remark on this. So um, there was a Me Too movement in the European institutions. There was a lot of cases um, that uh, came up to the surface. Um, of um, different treatment of men and women in the institutions, of systematic uh, bullying, of um, a lot of mobbing cases, um, direct harassment, sexual harassment, and so on and so on. Um, and kind of expecting that EU institutions will be immune to this was a bit of naive, I mean, naive compared to also the, the scope of Me Too movement that we also saw on the national level. So um, I, I, I'm, I just want to kind of... Um, um, I'd say I avoid the drama about it uh, because of course it's a drama to have a harassment anyway, but um, uh, yeah, we should not be naive and kind of expecting EU institutions to be uh, perfect by itself. Um, and then um, it's just a matter of what we are going to do against it. So I'm just gonna show you like quickly um, a video um, with me two movements. EU. President Tajani, time's up. You need to act now. Okay. So the ones who don't know, President Tajani was the president of the European Parliament. Um, the Me Too um, EU movement collected um, a lot of um, uh, complaints. Uh, when I say a lot, you can see um, how much paper it took to print all the complaints, uh, which they had a lot of cases. Um, and they were delivered to the um, to the president in sort of symbolic action, of course, but um, it was also expected from um, institution to take care of it. Um, there was a response. The, um, the anti-harassment committee was uh, formed. Uh, there is a um, institution or um, sort of uh, inter-institution body made equally from politicians and employees that is now auditing all these cases um, and so on and so on. So um, there's also, um, we don't have time now to go into it, but I think it will also be interesting to um, see what immediate response, because there's a lot of public pressure on the European Parliament. So immediate response um, meant that in a very quick time, in a very short time, um, a lot of um, actions to counter harassment were um, um, implemented. Um, and this might be um, interesting case study also on what can be done on a, in a national level um, as well, because this was very quick. Um, then the second thing uh, I would like to mention um, is that when you say EU, usually it means Brussels, it means institutions, um, but Brussels is also much more than political institutions. Um, it's also a um, place where EU civil society meets uh, because uh, next to the institutions in Brussels, you also have a lot of lobby groups, you also have a lot of um, NGOs um, from the EU level um, that are part of the political um, story and they, um, they are lobbying the institutions, they are working with institutions, but they are also kind of a place where uh, national initiatives both outside and inside the EU can be taken. So I, I just put some for um, for illustration, but there are many. Um, for example, the ETUG, the European uh, Trade Union uh, Network, um, has its own gender equality uh, group. 
Uh, then, uh, of course, European Women's Lobby is one of the, the biggest um, women rights organizations that uh, has its uh, members in um, all other countries um, and represents them uh, here in Brussels. Or, um, for example, the period, which is um, kind of uh, started as a grassroots um, uh, network of women who came together to basically um, empower each other, um, but then it also grew um, in a response towards institutions and harassments and so on and so on. So um, there is a lot of creativity in Brussels, there is a lot of organizing, um, there is a lot of um, combination of a national and EU level, um, and then um, this all can serve as an inspiration, but also as a partners um, to your national uh, initiatives. And um, I highly um, invite you to, to at least Google or um, ask me um, directly which other organizations um, there are, because um, there is really, really a lot of creativity. Um, and there I would like to, to finish. Uh, with Brussels as its best, because uh, again, like when when we mention Brussels, we are usually thinking institution and gray old um, buildings and people in suits, um, and that's um, really just um, a segment of what Brussels offers. But it offers a lot of um, rainbow activism on the streets as well, um, also by the politicians themselves, um, as you can see in the the top. Um, uh, left um, um, picture. These are all members of European Parliament that uh, from the organized by the LGBT intergroup um, that took a photo action to support uh, the Polish um, um, LGBT uh, groups. Um, and then there was a, a clandestine action in front of the Polish embassy, for example, or a huge um, feminist uh, march uh, for 8th of March last year, which was really out of proportion. Um, and I mean, it, it was a national uh, protest, but then uh, with um, all the people living in Brussels who joined and contributed with its own um, national and European perspective, it really um, grew um, up to the levels that basically the whole city was uh, purple and uh, protesting. So um, yeah, Brussels is much more than institutions in that sense. And again, um, a solidarity action is something that um, Brussels also has to offer, um, which does not necessarily has to mean that um, it will change the, the terrible reality on the ground, but it does echo um, in different levels on the national levels as well, as we saw with the Polish case. So exactly. I will stop here. I have no clue if, um, yeah, uh, this was uh, too fast or um, if there was a, um, a clarity on EU institution at all, but uh, let's take it from here and then maybe with some questions we can clarify. Yeah, thank you so much, Vesna. No, it was uh, a really, really like a good overview of institutions and what goes on in terms of uh, legislative work. Um, now, I am giving the floor to participants that are following us both on Facebook and Zoom. If you have any questions, feel free to write them down in the chat. Uh, in the meanwhile, um, maybe I would ask a question <laughs> while they think of their own. Uh, so speaking of uh, policies, um, here coming from a country where policy uh, isn't um, doesn't have so much power let's say like uh, there might be some laws uh, on a certain topic I don't know it doesn't necessarily be to doesn't necessarily need to be like a, on a gender but uh, in reality in practice these uh, these policies are just not um, not respected, let's say. So I was interested to ask you, like, besides these bodies that you already mentioned, like, what happens, like, in practice, uh, when they, what, what has been, like, adopted as legislation, uh, what happens in practice, like, when, uh, when these are not respected, basically, when the reality is a bit different from what, uh, what happens inside the, the institution? I hope I was clear. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. Um, okay, first of all, I think that uh, we should not give up on policies on national level neither, um, because at the end of the day, it's all about policies. And um, even if um, even if we have a, a struggle with it, a policy will happen one way or another. And then the question is just um, which policy? Yeah? I mean, the laws are simply there, the constitutions are there, and then. Um, 
um, even the debate and even a, a losing a debate at least meant that we had a debate. Um, and then knowing which law and policies we have, um, it's already a step towards bringing people for, towards a consensus to improve them. And I, I, I would say that part of the problems that we have is simply because we gave up on policies in certain areas, or at least trusting in policies. And um, now taking that to the EU level, um, as I said in, um, in, in, let me just go back to this crazy slide with Brazilian um, um, text, but uh, yeah, it's a European Court of Justice that ensures that EU law is interpreted and applied um, and ensure that uh, countries and uh, institutions obey um, um, the, abide the EU law. So technically there is a body. So um, in the most technical terms, there is a body, European Court of Justice, that serves exactly for that. Um, then we have seen in last years, for example, with Poland and with Hungary, that um, there are certain issues with especially rule of law, um, when one country within the EU does not really, let's say, follow directly, and I'm very generous here, um, directly the, the legislation um, and the, the regulations of the EU. And then that ends up to be a huge um, drama and it ends up to be a huge political process because it's also very hard to, um, to, to impede, to penetrate the national um, level uh, and the national legislation. And this is especially hard when it comes to the gender issues because gender, apart from it having its own um, policy and legislative perspective, it also has a huge traditional and cultural perspective. Um, and then um, to bring um, um, to bring the legislation only from the EU level, it will very hardly work. Um, as much as in, on a national level to bring, you know, out of nowhere um, different legislation, it doesn't work. Um, so in that sense, the role I, I, I think that that just reiterates the the need for civil society to be there and to constantly work on education, on mobilization, on debate, um, and legislation should be the last part. I mean, the legislation should be there when we already have a consensus. Um, because if we are fighting on the legislation and policies with kind of barely reaching, you know, 50% or how much you need, um, that makes it very fragile. And um, like, for example, when, when you look at how um, the debate about abortion went in Ireland a couple of years ago, um, it was almost inimaginable um, that you know it will pass, but then the civil society and the politicians who were fighting for it, they first spent ages in, in, in loads of activities and loads of resources in a debate. Um, and then once we had a referendum uh, on Article 8, I mean, it went more or less smoothly, um, simply because legislation came after a lot of work. So um, kind of disciplining, um, um, citizens and processes with legislation. Um, it might be fast, but it might be very rigid. Um, and then when it comes to gender, um, if you use it and do it only that, then we will have a lot of um, a lot of resistance. And then it's a huge question on how you police it, or as you say, like how you reinforce it and who has the right to do it, because it's also very private issue um, in, in many cases. And, uh, and then, yeah. I, I don't have a straight answer for you. I just think that your question really reinforces the, the mandate that the civil society needs to have on this and that we should not, um, exactly, we should not leave the policies alone and we should not say, um, you know, you do your, your policy as, as uh, politicians and then once it's over, then we're gonna step in, you know, but like rather we should have, um, take them accountable for the policy and cooperate with um, the, the legislators to make sure that policy which are, we are adopting are already there and already um, digested through the society. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe also I asked a question that's a bit all over. But we have another question. Um, what are the right-wing parties' uh, involvement in the FEM group and LGBTI group? Is there a strong reaction on the activities done by these groups? Um, I would say there's no right-wing uh, members of the LGBT intergroup. As I said, this is um, um, this is um, 
voluntary um, intergroup intergroups or voluntary uh, membership groups. Um, and I, I don't think, I don't know by heart, but I don't think that we have uh, members of um, ID, the, the right wing uh, group there. Um, when it comes to the FEM committee, um, I mean, committees have the representation from all the groups. Um, we don't have a drama. Um, we have, um, of course, um, differences. But um, I think also that it's worth understanding that in certain cases, um, especially in the FEM committee, um, this is exactly the place where you can negotiate um, with other groups. So um, under assumption, and I mean, especially in the European Parliament, which, um, which does have a certain consensus or um, at least uh, like FEM committee works, um, within internal um, debate and discussion. Um, it, it's not really black and white situation in a sense that you can kind of say, okay, these are progressive people, they're for gender equality, and then these are evil negative people who are there to stop us. It's rather, um, rather the work of the committee um, that serves for improvement. Um, and as such, um, it had great results with, as I show you, like some of the amendments, but also some of the opinions they are giving on, on the work of the whole parliament. Um, so um, I'm sorry to disappoint you that, you know, there it's really not, um, a kind of uh, conservatives against the liberals, uh, and then uh, you know greens kind of being uh, the, the the great genderist and all of this. Um, it's rather a working group of people who are really trying to find a consensus because they want to win um, the the fight as well. So um, yes, sometimes you need to make a compromise and you you need to give up of part of the amendment. Um, but the the role of the whole FEM committee is to make the work of gender of the European Parliament more um, gender equal. Um, and people who are in the FEM committee understand that. So they're not there to, to sabotage it, quite opposite, they're there to work for it. And um, of course, within the groups, um, people who get nominated or people who take responsibility for the FEM committee are also people with a the competence. Um, they usually come from the um, already background of working on the gender issues and women's rights. So um, it's, really, um, it's, it's really a body or at least a working group or a, a committee that um, that serves its purpose to, 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 to support gender equality when it comes to the work of the European Parliament. Then in the plenary, um, you do have a lot of um, um, exhibitionists, let's say, from the right wing who, um, I mean, there, there was this famous case uh, last year from one of the Polish, uh, or in last mandate from one of the Polish um, right wing um, uh, members of parliament or the ones from the Greece where they in their speech kind of try to by purpose provoke um, and um, and uh, take legitimacy from um, women's rights movement or uh, LGBT um, movements but um, I think that on a general level they usually get sanctioned also by the European parliament as an institution um, because at the end of the day hate speech is simply not allowed uh, in the institution. Thanks, Vesna. I think we had like a follow up question on this, uh, but uh, does it significantly slow down the decision making process? So I guess um, diversity in this group that we were talking about. Um, I, I, I wish to say Oh yeah, it does, but that would mean that we would have a legislative process on the on the gender issue at the moment. Um, and as I said, this is like not the the hottest uh, potato in the commission, especially now with the corona, um, with the huge um, monetary changes, with new budget, with new economy and trade, um, with climate change. Um, unfortunately, um, like simply in a linear uh, way of working and with time that it has, um, this is not something that is prioritized. And um, maybe, I mean, now this is just um, out of the blue uh, reflection to the question, maybe if we would have a bigger drama, there would be more attention to it as well. But bigger drama would also mean that like both sides have equal power to make a drama and that's not what we want. And I think that's also what we not believe that exists as a moment as the relation of the power within the European Union. I mean, we do have, um, we do have countries, we do have um, even governments or ministers um, and movements which are kind of anti-gender, which are trying to deny 
uh, and you know, call the whole thing as a gender ideology and propaganda and whatever, um, or who are withdrawing the funding from the gender equality uh, organization or women rights organization. But I, I think that at the end of the day, what we have seen in last year, it's still huge progress. Um, we have still seen that um, more and more women get um, elected. We have still seen that uh, protests for women rights are getting more and more massive. We have seen bigger and bigger solidarity. So um, people do go on the streets in Spain because of the, the issue in uh, Poland or um, in Ireland because of the protest in Malta. So um, uh, we have seen also that um, more and more institutions are kind of working on themselves. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that it's easy to to um, to to think and to to go to that direction that this is now the war that we have um, and we need to win, but it's really a long term process. And then I, I think we should really kind of think which bridges are we burning um, in that side. And at the moment, I would say, but then I'm also happy to to um, to hear other opinions. I think that the EU institutions and such are rather supportive um, and rather um, a huge resource um, to promote gender equality where there when there's time when there are resources. And again, coming back to to the original point, um, speaking about the Council of European Union as well. I mean, EU is as powerful to support the national level as national actors are able to react. Like EU is simply not going to be a magic wand or, you know, a magic broom that comes to any country, including European Union or outside of the European Union and fix it. Like it's it's not the idea at all. Um, and it's not the, the structure as such and nothing functions towards that direction. So um, it's really about the national actors um, and, uh, and the uh, stakeholders slash you, uh, the organizations, the NGOs, the, the protest movements, the local councillors, politicians, um, ministers or whomever we are talking about. And only when you have their strong devotion to the European Union and to the gender equality, then European Union as such um, can be very helpful um, in that direction. It works other way around as well. Huh? I mean, if you have um, um, if you have a government which are clearly against gender equality or work on gender equality, then parts of the European Union institutions which agree with it will be loud and say, "Ah, oh, you see, this is our people, and we are all the same." And la la la. So um, it, it's it's really um, to understand that the allies are there, but to have allies, it means that there needs to be an action. Huh? There needs to be a stakeholders which are taking the national action forward. Thank you. Um, now, you are saying that at the moment it's just not a, as big uh, as priority because we have so much going on, no? But I wanted to ask now, seeing that we have all these different committees, groups that are very, um, I'm not sure if it's the word, but let's say specified in the field, is there any kind of um, um, are they working together, let's say? Are gender topics being discussed actively when speaking now about, I don't know, the COVID crisis and um, about the climate change as well? Uh, because if, uh, if those are priorities at the moment, like are they being also kind of, are they also taking into account uh, gender equality and inclusion or, or it's very, I don't know, um, it's just not, uh, hmm. not a point. Of um, no, uh, gender mainstreaming is, um, is a thing, let's say, like that to start with. Um, so that's also um, like a role of the FEM committee. So for example, when you see these amendments, um, that's exactly about it. Huh? That's exactly about putting gender perspective in different reports. So when European Parliament is working on a digital agenda or it's working on climate change or it's working on trade um, documents, then it's exactly the, uh, the job that FEM committee is doing to ensure that um, in all these other uh, documents and processes, gender perspective is taken on board when needed or um, when urgent. Um, so in that sense, yes, um, for climate change, for sure. Um, then uh, there was also recently an initiative, um, for example, for recovery funds. 
And now with the corona, we had a debate about recovery funds and uh, then there is a huge investment package from the EU um, that is ready for the for the member states. Um, and then there is a strong initiative um, that you can also support. It's a, it's a petition that was there, but it's also part of the debate to ensure that money equally reaches um, all genders, because uh, also like in which sectors of recovery we are going to invest. Um, it doesn't mean that the final recipients of that money will equally be men, women, and um, all genders. So um, absolutely, I mean, in, in that sense, gender mainstreaming exists. It's already part of, uh, of processes. It's not necessarily that um, gender perspective is always included in the start of the drafting uh, of the processes and documents, but at least at some moment, it will be amended towards it one way or another. Um, and then um, I would also add there that's exactly Exactly uh, the work that European Women's Lobby does uh, a lot and other NGOs that are lobby uh, organizations in Brussels, um, they are working together with politicians and then also uh, other parts of civil society um, to embed gender perspective um, in what's coming out of the institutions uh, as such. So, uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. And uh, sorry if you're repeating yourself. Um, as we were saying at the beginning, it's kind of, uh, yeah, the structures and like all the work that uh, is being done within uh, within EU, it's a bit, uh, yeah, broad, <laughs> let's say. Um, let me see uh, if we have any other questions. I'm checking Facebook as well. Mm -hmm. We have um, mm -hmm, in the chat three recommendations you would give young Eastern European feminist politicians. Ooh. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, I would say there's, I mean, I, I would go back to what I already said. One is that policy matters. Um, and that um, the, what we also spoke now about gender mainstreaming, there, there is a lot that we can do on the policy level that does not necessarily need to be controversial, but it can um, also be a start on how to uh, work on the feminist politics as such. So um, if you want to be um, a feminist politician that works on gender uh, legislation, um, you don't maybe necessarily have to start from, um, you know, like renovating abortion law, um, but I would say there is a lot of um, a, lot, a big part of um, uh, of legislations where you can gender mainstream uh, without a lot of controversies and then start the process and bring people on board. Um, Going back to, to that as the second point, I think it's very important to build bridges and to uh, make allies. Um, because we tend to have a lot of um, um, confrontational style politics when it comes to, to feminism and gender equality. And I think that um, it's a one way to do it. It's also needed because it also has its target um, uh, audience. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it can only succeed if we manage also to bring everyone on board. And um, uh, as we also spoke about the FEM committee, um, like, people coming from all different uh, political groups, um, people with political differences in different fields um, can work together on uh, feminist policies as well. So um, yeah, um, it, it's good to, to understand who can be our ally on the topic um, as well, even though it might not necessarily be um, so visible. Um, and then I would, um, yeah, I mean, for the third one, there can be many, but just to uh, keep in the in topic of presentation, um, I would say that networking is highly important uh, and, and this international solidarity um, because it's a, um, it does provide you a feeling that you are not alone um, and it does offer a bit of hope um, because identity politics and uh, in that sense, also gender policy making can be very tiring because it also gets very personal very quickly. Um, and then ensuring that you yourself can be a support um, to others. It's also where a lot of motivation comes, but then also in time of need, um, 
knowing that you know cities all around Europe will torch their um, lights and um, kind of say that it really matters um, in the area where you are. I think that also uh, means a lot, and that is also something that can ensure the long term. Um, long-term work on gender policies because in some cases it will we will have to live with very terrible decisions and very terrible laws uh, put in front of us and very terrible regulations um, but then knowing you know that change is possible um, it can just kind of keep the light up and, and and motivate new generation of activists and politicians and ensure that the fight is not over and uh, maybe just to 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 finish with the quote which um, recently um, I heard from one of the French politicians, um, it says that um, feminists will always win. The fact that we didn't win yet, it just means that it's not over. Um, and um, in that sense, this international solidarity um, is something that can really keeps us up until we make sure it's over and we won. Thank you so much. I think that this is like a, uh, a very good finishing point and uh, maybe uh, we would stop here because uh, I don't see any additional questions um, but yeah uh, we are yeah I want to thank you again for joining us tonight uh, this was really insightful and yeah thank you for ending on uh, inspirational thought <laughs> let's say thank you